Bonsoir, good evening, bienvenue dans le film. Uh, I have to do it in English. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, it's so it's so great to have you here. Uh, please, a warm welcome for the Max Beckmann Preis Träger, Agnes Wada. It's so great to have you here. cannot imagine how excited we were uh, when we started this series, this lecture series in October, and it's for 10 months, and we, uh, we are watching all these films, these wonderful films you made, and you are still doing. She just told me uh, two days ago she was on the set and shooting a movie, and it's going on. <laughs> And uh, the most special thing is, I think, that uh, we are talking about these movies. Um, we don't only watch them, and it's so, so great. We have lecturers from all around the world that are talking on your films, and uh, afterwards we are discussing them. And I think that's uh, what makes them living and still living um, on with, with all your heart you have in your movies. I just met Agnes Wada today when I, um, with N Natasha Gikas, um, met you at the train station. And for the first time we met, and I thought, I know this woman for a long time, but I just saw your movies. <laughs> and you are in your movies and your heart is in your movies. And that's the point. We really uh, admire you for that and your great, great pictures you did. And uh, yeah, we called this series Self Portraits of Others. And that's exactly the thing, why that worked with me, um, I think, because you are in all your persons, you are showing us in your movies. And it's so great to have you here. I don't want to say much more because we have so much to hear from you to tonight and Christa Blümlinger will, will talk to you. And uh, But first I want to thank our partners because this all could not be possible if, if we wouldn't have uh, such great partners like the Goethe University, Vincent Sediger, with the film uh, Wissenschaft. That's really, really great to make all these series from Godin on Warhol on Pasolini and now Agnes Vada. A big applause uh, for that. Thank you very much. And I want to say a big, big hand also for the Hessische Film and Medien Academy, for the Institut Fra Franco Allemand de, de Sciences Historiques et Sociales. I can read. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, the Städelschule, the city of Frankfurt, they all um, supported us for this uh, event. But uh, I want to especially thank the Excellence Cluster Normative Orders. Um, because of this, uh, of them, we can uh, show you these movies. These, these movies and these lectures without paying for them. And that's a big applause, please. Welcome, Klaus Günther, the co-sprecher of the Excellence Cluster. And have a good night. Cher Agnes Wader, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, Gemeinsam mit meinem äh, Co-Sprecher Rainer Forst und äh, unserer Geschäftsführerin Rebecca Schmidt darf ich Sie im Namen des Exzellenzclusters Herausbildung normativer Ordnungen heute Abend hier im Filmmuseum herzlich begrüßen. Wir freuen uns außerordentlich, dass die soeben gekürte Beckmann-Preisträgerin unsere Einladung angenommen hat, trotz der wohl doch zumindest physischen Anstrengung, die mit einer solchen Zeremonie ja auch verbunden ist und äh, heute Abend hier über ihr Werk sprechen wird. Wir danken auch Christa Blümlinger, die Laudatorin der Preisträgerin, für ihre Bereitschaft, dieses Gespräch mit Frau Wader zu führen. Dieses äh, Gespräch ist Teil einer von Vinzenz Hediger, der zugleich assoziiertes Mitglied unseres Clusters ist äh, und mit diesem gemeinsam veranstalteten Film- und Vorlesungsreihe Selbstporträts von anderen, das Universum der Agnes Wader. In dieser Reihe wurden und werden, das Programm geht bis Juli diesen Jahres und am 11. April wird äh, Frau Wader wieder hier in Frankfurt. 14. 14, Entschuldigung. Am 14. April wird Frau Wader wieder hier sein und äh, wiederum für eine Diskussion über ihr filmisches Werk äh, zur Verfügung stehen. In dieser Reihe werden also die wichtigsten Werke der Künstlerinnen in Vorträgen vorgestellt, anschließend vorgeführt und diskutiert. Mit diesem Format einer Kombination von Wissenschaft und Kunst verbindet unter unser Forschungsverbund zweierlei. Wir wollen uns der Öffentlichkeit präsentieren und mit ihr diskutieren, inspiriert, irritiert durch die gemeinsame Rezeption eines Kunstwerks. 
Wir wollen uns aber auch selbst als Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler durch diese Erfahrung irritieren lassen und bisher nicht Gesehenes sehen, Ungehörtes hören lernen, um Fragen zu stellen, die bisher noch niemand oder niemand so gestellt hat. Nachdem wir ähnliche künstlerisch-wissenschaftliche Experimente schon mit früheren Kino-Ringvorlesungen sowie Ausstellungsprojekten hier in Frankfurt veranstaltet haben, schätzen wir uns nun besonders glücklich, diese Erfahrung mit dem künstlerischen Lebenswerk Agnes Wardas machen zu können. Und äh, ich muss sagen, was mich am meisten beeindruckt, ist diese Fähigkeit, in Bildern zu denken. Und das ist für einen Wissenschaftler, der ansonsten nur Texte rezipiert und über Texte diskutiert, wirklich eine völlig neue äh, Erfahrung. An dieser Stelle nochmals besonderen Dank an Vincent Hediger als Spiritus Rector dieser Reihe und dem Frankfurter Filmmuseum für die Kooperation. Als diese Veranstaltung geplant wurde, wussten wir noch nicht, dass die Künstlerin den Beckmann-Preis der Stadt Frankfurt erhalten würde. Auch wenn dies ein glücklicher Zufall ist, so bestätigt es doch die weise Voraussicht Vincent Hedigers, dass es an der Zeit ist, das künstlerische Werk Agnes Waders zu würdigen und sich mit ihm auseinanderzusetzen. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir dies nun auch mit der Künstlerin selbst tun dürfen. Nochmals Dank an alle Beteiligten und Mitwirken, dass sie das ermöglicht haben und ich übergebe an Vincent Hediger. But enough about me. Um, originally, we had planned for tonight uh, a lecture by Alexandra Schneider, and then shortly before Christmas, we were surprised by the news, and very pleasurably surprised by the news, that uh, the Max Beckmann jury decided to attribute the Beckmann Prize 2016 to Agnes Varda. Um, and basically, on the spot, Alexandra Schneider suggested that we should try to invite uh, Agnes Varda to the film museum rather than have her lecture on what is clearly one of the most personal films uh, of Agnes Varda, namely uh, the portrait and biography uh, of her husband, uh, Jacques Demy. And we contacted Agnes Varda and she gracefully uh, accepted and agreed, uh, agreed to be here uh, tonight. And we are very, very proud that she is ready to come here and uh, have a conversation about her work. Uh, with Christa Blumlinger. Um, one of the great artists of the, 21st, of the 20th century and of the 21st century. That's how we like to present her in the series. Um, every single film is a discovery. Every single shot in every single film, to me, is an image and an invention. It is a, a, a body of work of inexhaustible richness. And I am very excited to have Agnes Varda here tonight and to hear her conversation with Christoph Blumlinger. Christoph Blumlinger is a very old friend, a former film critic, now a professor of film studies at uh, Université Paris 8. Uh, so she's Austrian by birth, but now French by her country of adoption. And she gracefully agreed after delivering the, the the laudation tonight for the Beckman Prize to uh, moderate the conversation or actually lead the conversation with um, Agnes Varda, which is great because um, she is certainly uh, one of the scholars who knows Agnes Varda's work best. So please welcome together with me Christoph Blümlinger and Agnes Varda. Wir sprechen jetzt Englisch miteinander. Das ist der größte, kleinste gemeinsame Nenner. So, let's talk in English. It's also new for me. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I would like to speak German enough to be directly... But we have to go through that inter international language now. <laughs> so, let's go. Uh, as we heard, the series, the retrospective that is uh, taking place here um, in Frankfurt um, has been called, I don't know, by Vincent and Mark Siegel and the collaborators, Self-Portraits of Others. So uh, maybe we should first talk about your understanding of what you would, would think is, is a self-portrait. I think it is not about talking about your life, about autobiography, but it is more linked to maybe the term of confession, confession in the sense of Montaigne, a personal way of presenting one's thoughts, a kind of skeptical meditation. Or, as I said in my talk, in my Laudatio, a miracle chamber about presenting your collections, your recollections. 
Or maybe we should put it into the words of Jean Vigo, un point de vue documenté, a documented point of view. My question now is double. So what, what is for you the self-portrait, but what is the self-portrait of others? What about this term of others? In most of your films, the other, the portrait is a kind of partner, somebody who is close or whom you met. It's an encounter that is taking place and that produces something very, some closeness. But what about encounters where you meet, you get some resistance? I think about the f very beautiful film, Idessa, Lourdes, etc. But there might be others, um, yeah, where maybe uh, there was a real challenge to film the other. First of all, for what I remember, self-portrait of other, it's a Gertrude Stein word, for what I know. So, but it's a good, it's a good thing to say. I, in a way, I don't agree. Uh, I, I am in my films by narration, by knowledge or curiosity, but I've made so many films in which I'm not involved. When I met that woman, I was in the Munich House of Kunst, and I saw that exhibition about Idessa Handeles had made, I don't know if some of you saw it, she had made a collection of photography before the war and during the war, in which every group had a teddy bear. And, you know, school groups, military group, even people going as a fiancé to the photograph, they all had this teddy bear. It was a big competition of the German teddy bear, I don't know the company who made it, and the American teddy bear company. I mean, they were sharing the market of teddy bear, and teddy bears were everywhere. And she had like hundreds of images with teddy bears. When I visited the exhibition, she had made something very bizarre. In the last room, there was a sculpture of that famous sculpture of Maurizio Catalan, a little boy kneeling with the head of Hitler. It's a famous sculpture. And I was so shocked that when I came back to the exhibition, I noticed that I was looking differently. And so suddenly I saw the violence, little kid shooting at their teddy bear, teddy bear being pushed. And I said, I have to make a documentary about that. So I have nothing to do with that. I mean. My curiosity sometimes brings me to say, I should share with other people what I have discovered or seen. Uh, and others, I could say about, I made other films about the Cariatide, I made film, I made fiction films uh, like Le Bonheur, which has nothing to do with me. Not that I'm unhappy, but <laughs> I'm not in that series of feelings and La Pointe Court, I knew the place, but so I'm impressed that because of the Gleaners and I, in which I appear as trying to be myself part of these people, even though I have a bed, I have a place to sleep and I can eat, but I was trying to be as near as possible. Then. So I put myself with them and the beaches of Agnes, which is among other things, telling my life, not as confession, When you quoted Montaigne, Montaigne is a very serious writer and philosopher. And I was impressed that one of the last book he made, you have in Preface, comment s'appelle Preface? Robert. In which he said, as a very serious man, you know, being representing French philosophy, and that he said that becoming old, he thought that his friend and family, maybe should know a little more about him, as if before dying he should give a little of himself, information or feelings. And that's how I say, well, if that serious man can do it, I'm not very serious, but then I could allow myself to do it also. And that's why I allow myself to tell more or less my life as very part of all the people I've met, people I love, people who loved me, people I and count my surprises, my relation with the people, the, the war, the situation of the Jew and the just, the, 
die gerechten Test. There is a word in English, I don't remember. And my relation with feminism and with love. And so as, as part of a, I would say, like a chronicle of that time. So I don't see myself so much portraying myself, even though I appear because I do the narration. I say it myself. When I was younger with the shorts, and I write a narration, commentaire, and ask an actor to do it, or two actors. Then I thought, why should I ask them to speak? And for me, when I speak to you, I speak myself. I don't ask an actor to answer to Krista. So I could speak myself. And I started to do my narration, to record my voice. And then say people, oh, you are in your film because of your voice. Okay, so fine. If you prefer the voice of Isabelle Huppert and the Pardieu, you're right. They are good actors. And what about the Jean Vigo uh, idea about un point de vue documenté? Oh. Uh, it was uh, uh, written. Uh, yes. In uh, I think it was in the context of uh, à propos de Nice. Yes, I but, totally but agree. But even in Le Bonheur, I mean oh. the way that but you documenté is a minimum of trying to know what you speak about. And and when I made the film Saint Antoine that you didn't translate in your speech because it's a very strange German word. Vogelfrei, yeah. which has a double meaning for what I understand. And I like very much that translation. And in Vogelfrei, it's all fiction, even though it looks like it has the texture of documentary. But it is a point of view documentaire de Vigo. I investigated about this. I, I went on the road. I took in my car some people walking on the road, women, men, <coughs> asking them to tell about their life, how they survive, what they do, what is their will, hating society, whatever they say, they say, society is bad, you know. I tried to take a girl in my car. She was really rebel and dirty. And I said, okay, you don't need, let's stop in a restaurant, let's have lunch. The restaurant said, out, you know. She's too dirty, she doesn't look good. So I had to investigate what I call a point de vue documenté, what they feel, how people are xenophobic, come on, Tini. Xenophobic. Yeah, because they hate strangers. They hate women and women. And sometimes I would go alone in a farm just to ask a question. They were, you know, a sort of, come on, méfiant, méfiant. Suspicious. Huh? Suspicious. Because, because I was alone, just going on the road. So, The point of view documentaire means that I try to involve myself in understanding the subject I want to speak. And then I write, and then it becomes a fiction. And whatever they do, like a testimony to the camera, all these people, the, you know, the worker, the garagist, it's written. It, but I ask them to do it, but it's written. So I would say that my work is always trying to cross the border between documentary and fiction, fiction and documentary, including in my work as an artist. I use, you know, a new shape of work. Like you spoke about the widows of Noirmoutier, and there is a screen film in 35 millimeter, but there are monitors of video with each of them as a portrait for one widow. And I try to find another relationship with the audience. People have to sit on the chair, take a headphone, and listen to only one widow, and change of chair to listen to another one. So if I change of category, and try to go into what they call contemporary art, it's because I love the feeling to have a full room and a screen and people together visiting, discovering or loving the film or not. But I love the other feeling in exhibition in which you put yourself in risk because people enter in the gallery. Maybe they do this and they pass. Maybe they stay a little. Maybe they take the earphone and then they wait for the other chair to be the earphone to be free. So I'm really trying to investigate about what is the relationship between the images, film, or other things we put, and the, and the audience. I mean, I work always trying to understand how could I make the audience go with me without telling them what they have to think. Proposing a fluidity, can you say that? Fluidity. Fluidity. Yes, fluidity. Proposing so that Going from one thing to another, 
that it looks sometimes that they make films oh this or this or this but this is to give the audience the feeling of freedom I don't I have no message I have nothing to say you have to understand this and this when some people ask me about what you what you had in mind to do this okay I can tell it but you you can know it or not you you the audience have to invest yourself the way you look at film I mean it's you make the film the same way I say that a photo is just a piece of paper. If nobody looks at the paper, it's dead, you know. If you look at the photo, whatever you see, whatever you feel, you, that it's the, the connection of the art piece or whatever it is with the people who watch. So, uh, And there's a title, maybe. There are words that you put to the photo. Yes, but when you say, I'm speaking about myself, no, I'm trying to get the audience to go somewhere where I went, but maybe next to it, or maybe before or after. It, like, you know, everybody has a way of capturing. The image can be read in very different ways. A sequence of film, including full film, can be understood or not or felt. Okay, you are a critic, so you learn, you do analysis, you discuss with your student how they should read this and what are the keys. and. But maybe there are no keys. I don't think people should be understanding everything. They should just feel something. Maybe it's not understandable. Maybe I don't express myself clearly enough. I, no, but I don't care anyway. Because I don't want to justify what I do. You know, you get it. You don't get it fine. You like it. No, but if you feel something for yourself, it's fine. I mean, for me, you know, we learned that. I'm sorry to say, but Jean Villard, the film the theater yeah. director with whom I worked when I was very young as a photographer. He was the one who brought Brecht in France. Can you believe that nobody had heard of seen a piece of Brecht in 1951? Yes, and he brought Mer Courage. Mutter, yeah, but he, Mutter Mutter Courage. Courage. And but I even remember in, in German it was not uh, on the program of the schools, Brecht, at that time. Ah. Oh. Now it is, of course, <laughs> but... <laughs> in France, too. But I remember that Helen Weigel, that incredible mm -hmm. actress, or Besson was a man where they would come to check that Jean Villard was not betraying, come on, the... Uh, trahir, betraying? Betraying, yes. Betraying the spirit of Brecht. We had to understand this sensation and all that. But I got that as a milk of my youth, you know. And I thought that we do the same in film, We don't ask you to be with me. I want you to, be, to keep yourself, your own life. When you look at the film or at anything you look at me, I, I made, you have to invest your own sensibility, your own age, culture, whatever, you know, the, the way you feel that day. And maybe the same feel you see it another day. I know people who are so clear when they were in love, they say, we were in love, we're so clear. And then 20 years later, they were no longer in love. And then they're so clear and say, oh, it's about time and, and sensibility. And so it's interesting. I don't have to say that you have to be in love to see the film, even though it's okay. Mm. But I'm saying that every day, every moment of our life, we are a person watching a film or visiting an exhibition. And you bring your own look. And that's what I like to, to share. It's not, you know, it's not that I never say, This is the message. You mm. have to understand this and this. I wanted to say this. I want to express. In a way, I have nothing to say. Um, well, it is in my film. I, I don't have to. I don't wait myself stupid. I have to share. There's no message. No that message. You can't reduce uh, the film or the. Um, Sometimes I say the, no, the message are brought by the postman. <laughs> But um, maybe let me. Um, Or now SMS. <laughs> Let me ask you another question concerning uh, this um, um, this relationship um, in your work between what you do in the art field and your films. You you just mentioned that you are just now shooting a film together with an artist. It's the first time uh, that you co um, you will co-sign this film with uh, Gr, a French artist. Uh, but um, my question would be, um, the cinema is present in, in 
quite a lot of your um, artistic uh, uh, shows. Um, I was mentioning uh, La Cabane de l'Echec, where you uh, bring back a worn-out uh, print um, to the... To But the this somewhere. is about recycling. You yeah, know, you recycle. They, no they no longer want 35 millimeter films in many of the places, maybe not in the museum. They no longer have projector for 35. And I thought that the film that was an old film in 35 millimeter and a failure. Why should I keep all these prints? So it's an idea of re revenge mm -hmm. of the of the failure, the public failure, and recycling the material. I made a shack which was made with the film, the actual 35 millimeter print, a full print, 3,500 meters. I used them to do the walls and the roof of the shack. So it's 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 the eshek doesn't mean anything any it's longer. It's a détournement uh, somehow. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's yeah. what I can do with with I have But made with my life. And now with my other film, including Cleo from Five to Seven and Le Bonheur and Saint Anne Vogelfrei, I'm trying to invent shacks in which I can use these bloody prints that we can no longer show. And it's piling like this <laughs> in boxes. I even made a stool with the boxes. That's and now I'm doing, I try to do something with the boxes, like, come on, dear ressort, spring. And I, if you put boxes like this on a stair, they could do like, you know, the game of the spring going down. Jump. So it's, just, it's a way of farewell to the Bounce. 35 prints. Farewell, farewell, c'est ça, adieu. Farewell to, not to the language, mm. but to the actual film, actual stock. So it's a way of going with what's happening. Not crying over, oh my God, it yeah. was this and this. We don't care. It's just, what can we do today with what was my past, my technical, my things? It's not, But it's not regrets, you know. It's, it's also I'm you. now, I'm still alive, as you can see, somehow. <laughs> and this is true that two days ago, I say it in my little speech there, that while you were doing the parade of Carnaval yesterday here, I was shooting on the on the sea in Normandy. It was an incredible tempest. Did you see that in the news? In a huge tempest. And we went to, to the beach. We couldn't even go, you know, but we G Air, you know his work? J Air? J dot Air dot. He's a street artist, becoming photographer, and he started to huge to do huge images on the walls. And he made something very interesting about the subject of migrants, that we don't know what to do with the problem, which is a huge problem in all countries and a huge uh, move of population and dramatically told every day in the news. Every other day there is another boat who fall and children and people who died and countries that don't know what to do. Now they are building a sand wall somewhere in two countries. So I thought, you know, We used to go on the beach to do little castle with sand. Now they do borders with sand. So the world is so complicated. And Jihe had an ID. He took a picture of a migrant somewhere in New York, standing man. He knew that it was a real migrant, nothing special. The man is standing. And he made a print of 50 meters that he put on the floor of a huge place in New York. So you may have seen that in the New York magazine, they, had, they did the cover with that. So the huge man standing is lying on the painted, not painted, it's layer of photo, you know, they had like, I don't know, photo, photo, photo. And then the people work on it. And I thought it's, it's interesting because he tried to say, this is a migrant, that's what we do, we step on it, and we are artists. And he gets the New York Review magazine. That, pardon the contradiction that we are as artists in a world which is a chaos, that we, we cannot change it really. We can just be there. Well, witnesses or witnesses or maybe artist witnesses or maybe nothing, just, you know, selfish artists going around. But it's, it's true. There is a part of us which is just, we love so much to do things, to take pictures, to show them, to share with people. You know, in this museum, they're showing my film 
every month, I think, or every two weeks. I mean, it's it's an incredible gift for me, which means they propose to your audience to know me over a period of time, just not one evening, you know, like, and some people come speak about my work. I, I never listen, I must say, and <laughs> I'm not able to read what is written about me. I feel like they take my dress out. I mean, I feel like naked when I read it, so I don't read it. You're right. <laughs> I don't, I'm not right. I know very beautiful people came from Madison, you know, in Wisconsin, a woman, Kelly Conway, she did a lot of review, the working, she, and then she wrote a book and she sent it. And I say, thank you. It, it, uh, physically, I cannot read it. And it was another symposium in Rennes. A lot of people came from Germany, from France, from Spain. And then when they report what they said, I feel I feel I should not read it. So I'm sorry for those who work so much about <laughs> understanding what I do or inventing what I do. They are right. It's, it belongs to them, no longer to me. So let me um, talk maybe... Uh not so much about uh, those who <laughs> who comment on your work, but on your work and your future work. And getting back to the question of the art space and the exhibitions, uh, sometimes you did also some variations that came out of your films. I think about your exhibition La Mer, etc., that you did in set, uh, where you had a kind of variation on mirrors um, in the entrance uh, part that was quite close of Liplage Daniès, for instance. But the mirror and is the tool of the artist who wants to do a self-portrait. But the chic is to do mirror without being there. Mm -hmm. So I put all these mirror on the beach and they reflect the people who work with me. I show them the mirror and then the, the sea itself. And then sometimes I appear, but it's mostly using the tool mirror as an object mm -hmm. that could mean that you want to see yourself but you don't want so much. I'm trying to play with all the myth of art, like tools, but just the, the, the tournament, come on, dit. Yeah, it's a, a Zweckentfremdung. Um, some, yeah, somehow. Uh, did, you can say, uh, <laughs> even in, in, in American, the, the tournament, yeah. The tournament. So, pas de mineur. So are there any projects that you had uh, in film and that you could maybe transform and uh, uh, easier, uh, easily, maybe, or more easily um, uh, transfer into the art space? Because uh, producing a film is a very expensive thing. We will talk about Jacques Oudenant in a minute. For instance, uh, I don't know, La Mélangite. Uh, 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 was a project that uh, was very interesting, but you couldn't produce it at the time as I... But you see, you are speaking about films that I wrote and couldn't make, but I don't live in regret. You know mm -hmm. more about that film than me, because I spoke about that film I did make. I spoke to that 20 years ago, and you remember it, and I forget <laughs> about it. Because it's just not that you have to go on like this, but I'm, I'm alive, so I'm doing what I can do now. You know, it's I can. I wrote about my films, my former films. I started a book which was Varda Paranias, but I stopped in '94. And everybody said you have to do the second part. And then, then I didn't take the time to do the second part. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm able to say what I felt when I made the film. Doesn't mean that it has to be understood. But I can't remember my relationship with the subject, with the time, the, the weather. You know. We shot Vogelfrei in the winter. That was very important. We felt the winter while we were shooting. And and the bonheur, we shot it in the full summer. It's Everything is physical in a way, even though it's an idea that I like to uh, do variation of the idea and uh, play with the idea and play with the subject, go around, you know, and try to see, can we get more understanding by going on the side? And uh, all the people I like to film, the outsiders, the marginal, come on, the marginal, marginal people, people who have not been in the light, the gleaners that I filmed, 
people that nobody spoke about. The world had disappeared in the French language. And the gleaners, they get on the floor, they get, they get what we throw away. They eat what we throw away. And I was impressed by, not that they are poor or miserable, because they are, but what is their relationship with the world? What they speak about? How they speak about society and waste and, and recycling? It's, you know, I approach people who are in the middle of the subject of there is too much consumption, too much waste. So, and I, I try to see people who are a little out of the way, you know, and I've made a film, an installation about squatters, how they feel that they have the right to be there and then people kick them out. So it's another way of being migrant of the society, just being out of it. And not that I have specially attracted, but I think to give them voice and face because they are not the stars of the society. Very few people speak about them or film them. Even though the news on TV are now very following what's happening. I'm impressed how they do documentaries in a way, in every news and every day. But I, I try to say that my work starts where TV stops. It's like I should do more. I should approach them better. I should try to get something out of the cliché, even though we always go to the cliché, then can we reinvent the cliché or give another lecture of the cliché? All these subjects are part of my work, so I go from one idea to another for one category of people. And I don't, even though you feel so, I don't have the feeling that I'm so much speaking about myself. Sorry. Kisa. It was not my, it was, I was just um, trying to investigate about the title of the retrospective. But as there will be a film shown tonight, uh, Jacques de Nantes, I think we should maybe uh, close our conversation with um, some um, uh, questions concerning these films. I, I don't like to talk a lot uh, uh, before the screening of a film about the film, so I won't uh, mm. really say um, uh, a lot, but maybe ask you uh, this uh, wonderful films uh, where uh, you, uh, that I would call an, an essayistic fiction uh, anyway, uh, that evokes a childhood or, um, of a uh, big filmmaker, your partner Jacques Demy. Um, is um, I, you, you found you invented a form to do this film, but yes, and what I'm saying that you spoke about when I prepared the film, the title was Evocation of Evocation because I had been very impressed that Jacques Demy always told me that as a child he, he, he loved the idea of making films and trying to to be in the film system before even being big enough to do it. And and I was very impressed because I came from a youth, uh, childhood, that insp doesn't inspire me at all. Maybe now because I have an exhibition in the city where I was born in Brussels, maybe some memories will come out, but I'm not so much interested in my childhood. And Jacques Demy was totally in connection with his childhood. And while he was sick, and already very sick, he, he couldn't really work, but he was writing his memory and typing every day, because at that time we were already in the typing system. And typing, and every other day at dinner time, he said, can you read this, can you read this? And you know, after a certain time, I thought that it would be a wonderful screenplay. He was telling his childhood from nine to 19, and I say, well, it's a screenplay, your story. And he said, well, well, yes, but would you like to make the film? I said, you should do it with say, I'm too weak. So he asked me to do the film about his childhood, which was very strange because I thought, will I be able to tell? Because he had made no dialogue. He was just giving information about what they did and what happened. And I said, but if I make the film, I have to invent what you said, what your mother said. And he said, okay, invent. It will become your film. So he gave me the material of the information. But I knew his mother. I knew the place where he had been raised, in a garage in Nantes. You could shoot on location. So don't, don't, we went to Nantes, to the place where he had been raised, with, you'll see the garage, 
and the little apartment in the garage. And I say, we have to rent this one. And the people knew that we wanted that, and they started to raise the price. <laughs> and Jacques Demy said to me, okay, there is another garage next door. To Go to the other one. Don't give what I say, but I have to be at the real place. He said, do you think it's important? I said, yes, it's important. I want to see the walls. I want to feel the walls where you were, the real place. I mean, obviously, we have to change the garage. We have to change the electric... Uh, Oh, the, you know, they put the cars up. Yeah, at the time, you know, the cars were there. There was a hole under the car, little steps, and people go under the car. It would work like this. So we had to re redo more the garage of the 30s. And the pump, the gas pump was still on the wall, was there. And the wall in front of their little apartment was still the same. I was so touched that I could be in the real material where he had been. Then I wrote the screenplay, the dialogue, and I had some information from his mother and from and Jacques. And sometimes I would ask little things about, do you remember this? And that is not really, oh yeah, maybe. And so I wrote the screenplay and we shot in the real garage and I cast a father looking like his father, a mother looking like his mother. And I will ask Jacques, do you think they look good? And for the children, we had to have three, four children, because, you know, when they grow up, you cannot have the same child for 10 years. So we had to find three Jaco and find a little trick to switch from one actor to another, from one child to another. And Jacques would come on the shooting <coughs> and sit and speak with the, the children. We come to him. <coughs> asking about the way he was playing. It, it's incredible because he was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he was in the middle of something reacting his youth, his childhood. I thought he was, he would come on the shooting sometime and look at the, look at the scene. And then <coughs> <coughs> he was very tired, so he had to come three days with me at the hotel in Nantes and then go back home nearby on the shore of the border and stay three or four days with Rosalie just resting then come back on the shooting just watching the shooting I felt so good that he loved the ideas he loved that the film was uh, taking shape and existing while he was dying he knew he was dying so I mean that illness see that was there was no hope so he was on the way of dying and being with me on the way of something existing, telling his childhood. Very strange situation in which I was happy to make a film because I always love to film, but totally perturbed, totally in, in pain and, and suffering, sharing whatever we can share about somebody sick, but sharing as much as possible and doing this. And this is off the film, you know, but... This, this is how the situation, the circumstances of the film. And then Jacques was there with us. And we did, uh, at some point he had to go to the hospital. So we came back to Paris. We built a little set of his apartment to continue, so to be sure he could be there. He would be on the set, at the hospital on the set. And we finished the film. And he died a week after. Such a strange situation that we felt as, uh, as a, on a human point of view, very strange, on a cinepa, cinema point of view, something that is like a declaration of war against death, you know, mm -hmm. if I can say so. But he died for, the, for, for real. So then you can imagine the editing. But just the after. editing is so great. It's so but precise. The editing, the, you know, I say it's first films. of are integrated and they come out of your scenes. It's I don't know what happened to amazing. me because <laughs> as a filmmaker, I love to work. I love editing. And I was with Marie-Jo Odiard, editor. We were working on the machine. And I know I could, I was crying, crying like this and saying, oh, two shots, two images before. Be careful with the sound. It should happen here. Cry. 
I never happened in my life. I was like two persons at the same time. I mean, really, it's, and I did a good editing with Marie Jo. We tried to do it very well, you know. We fought so that we understandable and getting the feeling that that child was gifted and was in the middle of the war. You see, it's, it's in a period that I've known, you know, the war, the German coming, and then the American coming, and <coughs> her life was difficult. And for me, and this is the story, I don't have to make it as a suspense. The film ends when he succeeded to go to school, to film school, which was his desire so much. So it's from a childhood to go into film school, which has a meaning for us, for filmmakers, for people who love films. But we did the film with a lot of help to get all the real thing, the ticket for the food, the place, the, all the, I would say, the props, the or... props and the set of that time and the costume. And since I was a period film, we had to have the hairdresser doing always the hair, the way people had the hair. And which is not my, you know, I try to film things happening now. So there was like a trip to the 39, 40, 42, and so, and a trip also in the incredible trip of Jacques being ill. So I don't know what happened to me. It's a special time in my life. I was two persons in the same time, and I was doing my best to be with Jacques and Rosalie and her brother and the family who were trying to keep Jacques, you know, in relatively good shape and relatively good health. But we, we couldn't do, we couldn't do what cannot be done. So I don't want, you have to understand, I'm trying to speak about cinema. Just to tell that sometimes we have to survive if we want that art to exist. Maybe I'm a selfish person. Maybe I'm just a filmmaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Agnes Vada, thank you.